This week I'm joined by Samuel Talcott, who is Associate Professor of Philosophy at University of the Sciences in Philadelphia. Having done graduate studies at DePaul University, he now brings the insights of continental thought and critical theory to philosophizing about medicine and the sciences. His research focuses on introducing, interpreting and extending the French epistemological tradition. He is the author of Georges Canguilhem and the Problem of Error, published by Palgrave Macmillan in 2019. And in this episode, we discuss the philosophy of Georges Canguilhem alongside discussions on Alain, Michel Foucault, Bergson and more. I'd like to say a big thank you to all my paid patrons and subscribers for making all of this work possible. And if you would like to support Omitics Podcast and keep us going indefinitely, please find all the links for that in the description below. It really does mean a lot. And also, if you would like to join the community, there are links there for that also. Enjoy. So, Sam Talcott, thanks very much for joining us on Omitics Podcast. We are going to be discussing the work of uh, Georges Canguilhem, or Georges Canguilhem, we just discussed pronunciation. Either way, it seems has been historically sort of noted that it could be, or George Kongiem, King Kong, as you were saying, is noted in Stuart Eldon's book. Um, so for the, for this, I have used Stuart Eldon's uh, Kongiem and also your own book, uh, George Kongiem and the Problem of Error, which was published in 20, uh, 2019 by Palgrave Macmillan. Both fantastic texts, and I have dipped, of course, into... The original texts, um, but as we were just discussing as well, Kangiem or Kongiem is uh, he's difficult to get a to get a grasp because the, he he expects a lot at, from his readers, as you were saying. So yeah, thanks for coming on. And um, before we jump in, just uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and what it is uh, what it is you do. Okay, well, thanks, James, for uh, having me uh, uh, on your podcast. It's uh, it's a pleasure uh, to be here. And to have a chance to to talk about um, so, um, uh, my work and, and and this book with you uh, a bit. So, um, so I was educated in continental philosophy um, at uh, Penn State University and then DePaul University in Chicago. Um, I've spent uh, I, I, I did some teaching at DePaul University uh, when I was a grad student there, and um, then a, a year or two at Seattle University before coming to University of the Sciences, um, where I teach a wide range of classes. Um, I'm in a humanities department. I'm the philosopher on campus in the humanities department. And I think, um, you know, I, I, I view my work as kind of interdisciplinary. Uh, and I think I've really benefited from, um, from being in a humanities department. Um, you know, uh, 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 Kung Yem, uh himself um, says, you know, something along these lines that you know philosophy flourishes when it works with material that is non-philosophical when it encounters what is foreign to itself and uh and i think uh you know having colleagues in the humanities has been uh has been great for that um and being able to teach some uh some interdisciplinary courses uh, to students who are at a university of the sciences which is a very interesting name um, <clears throat> but they are um, almost all the students are oriented towards healthcare professions uh, ultimately mm-hmm. uh, and so i really see a lot of my work as uh, sort of bringing philosophy to uh, people who are uh, <clears throat> getting into biomedicine uh, mm-hmm. as a as, as a profession uh, and <clears throat> so that means uh, sort of uh, trying to bring uh, sort of broader ethical questions uh, into into their view, trying to get them to think about what it means to provide healthcare, um, and also sort of and also since it's a university, what it means to be engaged in education. Um, so one of the things that I've I've noticed, um, and this connects to my interest in error, is that there is this how to put it a rage for getting it right uh, for having the knowledge uh, that is needed in order to uh, succeed. Uh, and so I, I think, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the central things that I try to get students in all of my different classes to reflect on is the, the meaning of error uh, and their fear of error in, in their lives. Um, so I, I view, uh, I hope anyway, that my, uh, my sort of scholarly work um, comes out of and feeds into uh, <clears throat> my my work as a teacher. 
Okay, okay. So it's almost a Kongiamian approach to to teaching in the sense of uh, something I was just reading this morning, actually, in my research, that understanding that uh, a doctor might understand how to heal, how to cure, but they, they don't understand on... They aren't taught to understand on that philosophical level how to deal with a patient in that that sense. Um, now, before we jump in with Kangi, uh, Kongiam, uh, I do have to ask you the Hermetics question. Um, so you can place three thinkers, living or dead, into a room and listen in on the conversation. Uh, who do you pick? And of course, with these episodes where people are we're, we're discussing uh, a specific thinker, they are already there. So Georges Kongiam is already there in the room and uh, you can p- place three more in there. Well, thank you for that impossible question. <laughs> uh, you know, my, my first, uh, yeah, so, so <laughs> well, my, my first response is to, is to wonder where I might place this room. And so I imagine a boat in the middle of the ocean or something like this. Uh, but no, uh, I mean, to, to try and, uh, and, and respond to, uh, to the question, I think, you know, so I'm fascinated with this French epistemological tradition, Bachelard, Canguilhem, Foucault, I see coming out of um, this uh, as well. And I'm uh, fascinated with it because um, I think each uh, wants us to think of research and life more broadly as a kind of uh, experimentation. Uh, each encourages um, an ethics of, of experimentation. Um, <clears throat> and uh, each also encourages, to, encourages us to think about, to understand thinking or thought as a technique, as something that we do. Uh, and in that, they, they sort of, they broaden the field uh, as to what might be considered thought. You know, like Foucault says uh, somewhere that he learned more from uh, reading now obscure figures in the history of science than he did from Hegel. Uh, and, and so I, I think I share this penchant, this interest in, uh, obscure figures, um, who maybe should be better known. Um, and so, so I would actually, I would, I would consider, um, some, uh, more recent authors, uh, who, and more recent thinkers who are in one way or another, I think all, uh, sort of responding to or offering variations on the importance of experimentation. Um, or error in their in their own work. Uh, so I would look to, uh, I would want to hear what Francois Delaporte, uh, Foucault's only PhD student, uh, <clears throat> would have to say in conversation with uh, Claire Salomon Bayet, who was a student of of Kangi Lems. Uh, she wrote on the uh, sort of the importance of institutions and the formation of. Um, <clears throat> experimentation as a method in biology. Uh, and I would also uh, put in the room, uh, or in the, in the cabin of this boat, <laughs> I would put in the room um, the, uh, the poet and philosopher, Edouard Glissant, uh, mm-hmm. who writes um, uh, about, you know, the, the, the pr- very profoundly and disturbing ways about the role that uh, dislocation, um, errancy, and exile uh, the the role these have played, um, the experience of these have played in shaping a, a new people um, through the the, the transatlantic uh, slave uh, slave trade, um, and I should say uh, Delaporte as well. I think uh, he's uh, he's fascinating for our our moment. Uh, his uh, <clears throat> uh, book Disease and Civilization argues that uh, <clears throat> the cholera epidemic of 1832 in Paris really uh, sort of crystallized um, <clears throat> the modern experience of um, social classes and, and race. Um, and, you know, reading his book, uh, <clears throat> it's really just stunning uh, to, to find out uh, about or see all of the sort of the, the, the political, social political strife that emerged in 1832 in Paris and how it is, uh, you know, mirrored in the sorts of things that are going on in our in our very moment uh, that that we're living in uh, as well. So, if, if we were to look to that that text as a as as sort of prophetic, what uh, what came after? Where where are we heading into? Ah, where where are we heading where, into? Where does that where does that cholera epidemic? You know, what 
is solidified culturally and politically by the you know by that cholera cholera epidemic i guess would be there yeah so i don't i don't know what we're heading into <laughs> i mean i think delaporte would say um we are where where the the danger is we're going to get more of the same um but in in his uh in his account um <clears throat> in in his account sort of an old division between the civilized europe and barbaric east um india in particular um where the cholera was known to have, have come from um in his account that uh that division was sort of mapped on to internal class divisions that were em- emerging in France at the time. Uh, and so poor people became sort of refigured as uh, a class of um, basically uncivilized or supposedly uncivilized um, people who needed to be managed. Um, and uh, so this was this uh, this way of thinking was then able to be exported uh, to, in, to various colonial projects uh as well um and it's intimately tied up with the the invention of public health uh the idea that we need public health experts uh to manage the health of the population to make sure that the people are healthy enough um since they can't care for themselves um are are healthy enough to contribute to society um and 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 also i think you know delaporte is is trying to get at this uh, sort of the potentially disturbing side of our desire to be healthy uh, and the way in which we can uh, put ourselves into the power of others in this through this uh, through this desire. So there's a lot going on in his book. Um, mm-hmm. and uh, <clears throat> uh, I think one of the one of the sort of the the, the major fruits of it is he's urging us to sort of reconsider our assumptions about, um, you know, who is who in, and, and, you know, what, what's being represented in the, uh, <clears throat> the debates <laughs> or the disagreements that are going on in our society right now. Okay. Okay. Um, so, you know, back to your room, is that where you think the, the conversation between those people might, you know, head towards is, is this idea of health? I mean, you, you've, put in uh, Glisson, this poet, and I think that introduces enough for them to not feel that they're in a stifled sort of philosophical conference atmosphere, which I imagine they, they wouldn't want to be in. They'd want doctors or poets or something else to drag us out of that theoretical sort of stasis towards something with some form of application. So do you think that's where, or do you think it might just turn into some sort of strange philosophical experiment? Uh, yeah, I, I don't know what what might come of it. Uh, these are um, these are all thinkers that uh, are relatively new to me, and so I'm excited to, <laughs> to, to I would be excited to hear what they they would have to say to uh, to each other. Um, <clears throat> so it might be a strange philosophical experiment, um, but I think right. I, my my first image was of the boat. Maybe we'll come back to boats later <laughs> with with Kangi Lam, um, but. The right, it's, it's the, the out in the world somewhere um, is where this conversation is uh, is happening, uh, and right, Le Glisson um, writes about um, the middle passage um, and the the role of this uh, right the this passage, the role it played in transforming people who had been dislocated from their homes um, into in, into in, into slavery. Um, <clears throat> And so, I mean, I think they're each interested in questions, larger questions of justice um, and health figures into this. Um, but I think, uh, I mean, for me, at least, the, the question of the relation between sort of justice and health is a, is a big and, a, and an open question. Should we view a just society as a, as a healthy one uh, or, or, is there, or might we hesitate about that? Might we find, might we worry some, um, especially given all of the uh, expert discourse there is about health today mm-hmm. might we worry about saying well we have an idea of what a healthy society looks like that's a just and that's a just society mm-hmm. as well um, and so we should we should play that out um, so I think it would be a, uh, a a productive and interesting dialogue I don't know where it would go but I think that each of these thinkers in his or her own way 
views error as something positive um, in whatever sense we give to that term error. So error can be, you know, a mistaken belief. Um, it can also be uh, <clears throat> Uh, trial and error and that that sense of an attempt that may work out or, or may not where it's not informed by knowledge but it's a it's an endeavor <laughs> a risky one um, and in that sense it also connects to um, you know we can think of experience as always being shadowed by um, the possibility of uh, error uh, and experimentation as a kind of systematization of or a formalization of of practices of trial uh, and error. So I think, you know, error, I guess what I'm trying to get at is that error can, you know, has, it can be understood in many different ways. Uh, and I think each um, brings something, uh, an important experience of error uh, to, uh, to the conversation. Okay, okay. And so this is sort of uh, the, your reasoning, well, perhaps you just wanted to write a book, but uh, your reasoning for, for writing your text is this in this importance of error, which of course ties into this entire, um, in abstract ties into this entire, uh, many of the, the ideas we're talking about here, which is in relation to what is considered normal, what is considered pathological, you know, the idea of an abnormality is of course in relation to whether or not something's erroneous. And of course, if you see something as an error that immediately pre presumes there is some true course of action, which we've strayed from. So the investigation into error itself and not an error constrained is whether or not the actual entire course of action you're on how can we consider that to be normal you know why is something an error am i on somewhat the right lines as to why you you, you crafted this book yeah yes yeah absolutely um <clears throat> uh the i mean i i think you know i would just add to what you were saying you know the discourse of error is 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 widely spread in our society and it's a way of dismissing uh, <clears throat> right it's error in its sort of strictest sense is you know the mistaken belief um, but it is applied very widely to dismiss you know people uh, <laughs> for um, you know uh, you know say we don't need to take this person seriously or um, more uh, seriously, um, you know, we can envision a project of correcting them, changing their behavior uh, in uh, in some important way. Or, you know, Kangi Lam, I think it's also important to remember that he wrote his book in, um, on the normal and the pathological. He wrote this in 1943. Um, or, yeah, he finished it in 1943. He'd been working on it for uh, throughout his medical education. Um, but this was the very moment when people around the world were being murdered or experimented on um, because they were said to be abnormal um, and to be errors that needed to be, you know, corrected or uh, or eliminated and learned from in the in the process. So, yeah, I think that's you know that that is uh, though you're you're absolutely uh, right. I mean. Um, and, and I would also add, you know, sort of intellectually, like I, I was interested in Foucault first, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, his history of madness. And, and that's how I came to, to Kangi Lam, uh, and found his, his writing, his book on the normal and the pathological, absolutely perplexing. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and, uh, wanted to, wanted to learn more. I was also very curious about this. I, this, uh, uh, you know, Foucault said, uh, Kangi Lam is a philosopher of of error, and yet when I read, when I first started reading uh, his book on the normal and the pathological, it seemed like there was a lot about normality and pathology, but not much about error. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I was, uh, I, I was, this led me to, anyway to uh, to take a trip to visit Kangi Lam's archives uh, in Paris. Uh, where I found that at two very important points in his life, um, he had taught courses dedicated to error. Mm -hmm. um, one in 42, 43, and the other one in the 55, in 1955, 1956 year. Um, and, uh, and so this, this sort of crystallized the, uh, my interest in, in trying to understand how error, the problem of error, very broadly speaking, is informing all of all of Kangi Lem's uh, writing. Or at least that's what that's my interpretation. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, I mean, 
you you yeah just staying with your book we were gonna sort of need to situate Kong M, I think soon for those who aren't aware of him and that's actually one thing I was going to mention to you I just quickly before we actually started uh, I try always look and see what other content people are making about thinkers and there's usually a few videos there is a lot of French videos on Kong M, but as far as my research went in this is the this is the going to be the only one in in English on on YouTube uh, which which I could find at least so um, to situate him is going to be tricky as as i imagine you well know but um just staying with your book you mentioned that the normal and the pathological um you this this is sort of much like with foucault everyone begins at madness civilization everyone begins it seems with congiem with the normal and the pathological that's the one which uh, is the is the most well known but you focus uh, at the beginning of your book actually before this um congiem has this strange sort of trickstery relationship with power which he turns back on itself as a as a way sort of forward so i was wondering this bit really interested me in your book so I was, and uh, you know um yeah so i was just wondering if you could expand on this because i think it was an important idea yeah i uh <clears throat> i yeah i think it's i think it's important as well uh <clears throat> and it uh it asks us to situate uh Kangulam a little bit uh, because He's um, <clears throat> well. One of the challenges of reading him is that he is he comments um, and writes about so many different other authors, uh, and so it's a it's a question of kind of teasing out um, where Kangilem might be, where he might place himself in relation to the authors that he's reading. I mention this because um, <clears throat> his um, he presents these ideas of power um, through. Um, or by systematizing um, writings by his um, lycée teacher, Alain, or uh, Emile Chartier, um, a neo-Kantian social political philosopher and pacifist uh, in the earliest 20th century France, um, who helped, you know, who was uh, key in the early education of Canguilhem, but also figures like Sartre uh, or Merleau-Ponty or Simone Weil. Um, but in any case, um, <clears throat> Uh, in the, the these ideas about power, uh, Kangilem presents uh, through Alain's writing, and he systematizes them at a moment in 1958 when the French military is um, basically basically topples uh, the government, uh, the existing French Republic, uh, <clears throat> in order to uh, for the sake of um, maintaining French possession of Algeria. Uh, and uh, so Kongilem sort of publishes, sort of organizes um, and outlines um, Alain's political writings um, at this moment um, as a way to reflect on the sort of what's going on or give, some pe give people some tools to understand uh, what is going on at the moment and resist it where possible. So to give a vision of what uh, a democratic society looks like. Uh, and so I think this is fascinating uh, because uh, Alain slash Kangilam in this in this writing, uh, they say, you know, until now, power has taken the form of, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> sovereign power, right, the power of uh, the king um, or the power of oligarchs, a small group that has power. But now we are witnessing something new in uh, democratic societies, namely uh, the emergence of societies of, calls them societies of control, mm -hmm. um, where power is um, now something that can be exercised by the people um, as a means of, um, <clears throat> well, exercised by the people in order to, to sort of rein in the natural tendency towards tyranny of, uh, of, of, of those who, who get um, power for themselves and the way in which they'll do this, Alain, Alain's vision is um, the way in which they'll do this is through surveillance. Um, so Alain has this vision of himself as a philosophical journalist, right? He writes about what's going on. And the idea is that if um, the public knows about um, <clears throat> the, the projects of those who um, are in control uh, or who empowered in government, 
uh, <clears throat> or in other ways, like through industry or through professional organizations like uh, doctors, uh, <clears throat> uh, if uh, the endeavors of these organizations or people is made public through journalism, then that's a way of uh, keeping them uh, in, in check, as it were. Uh, and so Kangi Lam, you know, he presents Alain's writings. He says, you know, this is essential for us to read now and reflect on um, and to put to the test by trying to see how far it applies to our present situation and to what extent it, it needs to be changed. Uh, <clears throat> so I would uh, just sort of, you know, uh, intellectually, historically speaking, I think uh, I I'm looking forward to when I find time to sort of thinking about how uh, Foucault's writings about power uh, could be read as a response to or a, a kind of an elaboration of um, some of the a, an altered uh, account of power um, that is based on um, what we find in this this Kangulam um, <clears throat> Alain piece published in 1958, but others too, like Althusser and Interpolation, um, <clears throat> or Deleuze writes about societies of control, uh, of course, famously. Uh, but, but I think I think I think very broadly speaking, this idea of um, turning uh, a practice or a way of doing things upon themselves, uh, this is something that Kangulam learned, I believe, from Alain. Maybe it goes back to Kant and the very notion of what critique is. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is. Um, I think we see it at work in all of Kangilam's own writings um, about the history of medicine or the history of science, um, like the normal and the pathological, constructed in, in an amazing and very interesting way. But the first half of the book, basically, as I read it, Kangilam says, you know, there's this thesis in medicine in the 19th century that there's no real difference between what is normal and pathological, that the pathological is just a, a modified state of uh, a normal, normal function, uh, normal, uh, <clears throat> normal state. And the authors who said things like this, they thought they were contributing to a profound transformation in their society, um, in uh, developing a society that would be based on scientific knowledge and unlike any society that came before. Mm -hmm. So Kangi Lam identifies a tension there, right? Um, is that, right, there's <clears throat> this... Uh, you know, alteration, um, the production of something, a radically new way of being, how does that fit with someone who claims that, well, sickness and health, they're basically the same thing, only variations, um, sickness just being a variation on, uh, on normal functions. Uh, and so he applies this thesis to um, these various authors who, uh, who hold it, he applies this thesis about the, you know, the the equivalence of pathologic, the patho pathological and the normal, he applies this to these various, very authors in order to undermine the, their claim mm -hmm. uh, that uh, there is no difference between the normal and the, and the pathological, uh, except a quantitative one. Kongi Lam very, I think, cleverly uh, <clears throat> turns their reasoning against itself in order to show that they misunderstand um, the the importance that alteration transformation has in our lives um, that that they they themselves contributed to transforming uh, society I mean that does seem um, almost near I, I mean I don't neo Kantian to me I don't like neo sort of anything because it's just it's either Kantian or but neo Kantian in that sense of Kant attending to saying basically to Hume, well, you can't, ex ex you know, attend to the experience of the conditions. You need to attend to the conditions of the experience before you can say anything about it. And it seems to me that what Kong Yem is doing there is attending to the conditions of the experience which people are writing about, you know, health and the idea of health, the idea of a normal and a pathological. Well, what are the what are the conditions for you to even construct these things? And in the alterations of these things, are the conditions themselves changing? So it does seem Kantian in that sense, but it's, I guess instead of um, attending to it on a purely metaphysical level, it's in relation to the social and the biological. Would I? Would that be somewhat 
Right. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's, I think that's nicely said. Uh, I think that's very nicely said. Uh, <clears throat> and I would add to what you were saying, uh, right. The, 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 the near Kantian idea, the idea of being a near Kantian. I mean, I think, uh, the, the sort of the spirit of Kangulam's philosophical thought is one of resistance. Uh, mm-hmm. and so if I were to situate him historically, sort of very broadly speaking, I would say that he tries to put himself at the crossroads of the sciences, uh, philosophy and culture more broadly in 20th century France. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, philosophically that means, um, uh, uh, both sort of being informed by, uh, a number of different philosophers, but simultaneously resisting them uh, as well. Uh, and so a, a kind of uh, <clears throat> resistance to uh, Alain's uh, Kantianism, or even to, to the, the Kantianism of Kant. <laughs> um, uh, you know, uh, so Kangulem really insists on, he, he, he learns a lot from, at first he's very much opposed to Henri Bergson, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, who he views early on in his life as a vitalist and philosopher of life, which means basically uh, someone who invokes life in order to justify violence and war. Mm -hmm. Um, So Kangulam early on is a pacifist and he is highly critical of um, people like Bergson. Uh, So Bergson supported the, um, you know, the the, the great war, um, which Kangulam grew up with uh, during. And so at first he's, he's highly critical of Bergson, um, but because of events in his own life, I think, um, he, he comes to, uh, think that there are some, uh, that, that, that Bergson in wanting to move away from talk about being to talk about becoming, uh, that mm-hmm. Bergson is pointing us in a really important, uh, direction for understanding our experience and the conditions of our experience. In other words, uh, <clears throat> whereas, you know, Kant can be read as saying the conditions of our experience are basically static. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, you know, the, the categories of the understanding are unchanging. <laughs> um, I think uh, Kangilem, while he believes that the conceptual categories through which we experience uh, the world and through which we make sense of our world while well, he thinks that they are enduring in mm-hmm. profound ways because they're rooted in culture. Mm-hmm. He also thinks that they are capable of altering uh, over time and, and can, uh, you know, experience radical shifts and transformation um, in, in meaning. Okay. There's also sort of an irony there in, in Kongiem's disagreement with Bergson that the, the Bergson Einstein debate, marks the very clear moment that uh, philosophy and science sort of separated paths and no longer wanted too much to do with each other. But um, one thing, I've, I've got all my questions here, and then last night I was doing some research and I sort of was going through things and I was like, okay, I'll just note this down to perhaps bring it in. And it was to do with the vitalism because I've had three or four different episodes where the idea of vitalism comes back. And I don't think I've seen academics sort of wince and go back out of their chairs quick enough when they hear that word vitalism because it's it's a tricky one uh for many of the reasons that you've outlined in that i don't know i don't think we all know what we're really talking about because there's a, there's a, there is of course and and this is especially difficult with congiem there is of course the vitalism of books on which is sort of the most i guess the most well-known form of vitalism but there's also the Leibniz philosophy with of people such as Ludwig Klagos, you could almost perhaps stretch it to someone such as Schopenhauer. I think there's there's elements of it there. But Kongiem's vitalism sort of changes, and I'm glad I'm glad you brought it up and not me. So would you would you like to expand on on how he takes that alteration to to, to build it up as something of his own? Yeah. Uh, so I think I I, I think it's a a, a big question. Uh, you know, uh, in in Kangilem himself, is he a vitalist or not? If he is, in what sense is he uh, a vitalist? Um, it's a, it's a huge question, and and maybe he's not entirely settled on uh, this himself. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, in in his book, Knowledge of Life. 
um, he presents um, different sorts of vitalism. Like I think um, he presents animism as a kind of vitalism, belief that there is a soul that brings living things or that, that makes living things living, <laughs> that animates them uh, as, a, as a form of vitalism. But then he also um, identifies as vitalism um, the idea, I think he finds it in Bichat, that the living can uh, living things simply can't be reduced to and understood in uh, terms of physics or chemistry. Um, and so in that sense, I mean, I, I think Kangilam would identify with vitalism in that sense, this idea that the that there is something unique about living organisms mm -hmm. um, and uh, we can't understand them simply by deploying the methods of you know physics or chemistry there and and the surest sign of this for Kangilam would be that there exists that that biology exists as a scientific discipline. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, he experiences in his own life, you know, the 20th century is a century of profound transformation in, um, in the life sciences or in, in biology, biological knowledge, understanding of, of living organisms. Um, <clears throat> uh, but, uh, but Kangi Lam himself thinks of, right, thinks of, of, of the living being as, you know, it cannot be solely understood in terms of the physic of the the the, uh, the physical sciences physics and chemistry um, and that doesn't mean it can't be understood at all in their terms but just that it can't solely be understood um, in their terms and so he looks at um, in this book knowledge of life he also looks at um, the way in which through experimentation biologists in the 19th and 20th century have come to understand living things in their own, more or less in their own terms. It's an ongoing sort of endeavor. Uh, but the concept of milieu or the concept of uh, reflex motion uh, or the concept of uh, the biological individual, uh, Kangilam thinks that these are all, these um, were all produced through long, laborious experimentation um, and that they really are true to life in some way. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they make biology as a science. Um, they, they cut it out and make it different from other sciences. It has a kind of autonomy um, that it gains by this sort of uh, grasp or understanding of, of life, um, <clears throat> at least partial, that it has, uh, that has achieved historically. So <clears throat> all that said, Kangi Lam will also, he also talks about vitalism in his book on the history of uh, the reflex concept. This is mm -hmm. his dissertation. He wrote it under another philosopher um, who I think is really important to him, Gaston Bachelard. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> uh, and so I would pick out Alain, Bergson, and Bachelard as being really important for understanding sort of uh, Kangi Lam's philosophical background. Um, but in this book about uh, the history of the reflex concept, you know, Kangi Lam says his interest in vitalism there is historical. And he says, if we look at it, we know vitalism today is an error. That's mm -hmm. false. But if we look at it, we see that it was incredibly productive in the history of the generation of knowledge about reflex is uh, mm -hmm. about reflex motion in living things. Uh, and so this so we can't we can't just excise it and say, do away with it, uh, forget it. We have to understand its productive role in the history of science. Um, uh, and because of this productive role, in a way, you know, contemporary science, even if it wants to be purely mechanistic, is still haunted by uh, this kind of vitalism, which outlines what should be an object of, of knowledge, this specific, uh, <clears throat> these specific qualities that living beings that living things have okay i mean i'm seeing a, a couple of sort of clear things there i mean firstly i'm thinking of Serre, who and michelle Serre, who i know is uh, influenced by bachelard and this idea of uh, uh sorry influenced by kongi M, and back to that idea of not being able to you know there is clearly something unique about being alive in the, this relation to vitalism but equally we still need this this biological framework to be able to understand it on the other level and 
the influence I guess I would see from for Ser there is this idea of these these don't really have to be compatible just don't you know they're two different forms of communication and subsuming them all into one is probably going to misunderstand both so you can do things on one level but you have to sort of retain it in that context and you can do things on the vitalist level but at the same so sort of i guess especially if with what um Kongiem, Kongiem is seeing in the 40s with as we've said the idea of abnormal humans there there seems to be a, a connection there between the idea that utilizing the biological framework to justify some, something on the the level of being is making a big error between two levels of communication uh, i'm speaking you know of thinking of people of justifying some idea of subhuman by something you've learned on a level which is not in that same context um but that actually brings back what we've been speaking about with with regard to to bergson so even though they had this disagreement bergson has these ideas of we need specificity we need contexts so that i know i've just thrown a turn on your plate there but in what sense can we sort of um is that something that it's important for Kongiem, this idea of retaining uh, a specific context? I mean, of course, he has this idea of milieu. Um, is that his his way of explaining why we need to we need to uh, you know stay within the bounds, so to speak, of certain structures? Yeah. Uh, so I think it's um, yeah. I mean, I think you're you're posing a really interesting question and and making some. Making some nice connections between uh, between Kungilam and uh, and Ser, uh, <clears throat> uh, and yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, right. One of the reasons that reading Kungilam is so difficult is that he is so focused on the text that he reads um, and asks us to think about them in their context. So I, I think actually Kungilam is a is a great thinker of place um, and context. Mm -hmm. um, and my take is that, uh, right, the, the living things, as Kungilem understands them, uh, need to be understood in relation to their milieu. That life, in some senses, is always uh, a relation between, or works out as a relation between um, a particular individual uh, or set of individuals in um, a milieu, um, a milieu which is organized for the sake of living, uh, for the sake of that individual's life, uh, right? So some things uh, get picked out as food and other things get picked out as uh, excretion. Other things get picked out as, you know, uh, uh, dangerous uh, as a predator, uh, so right, so the so the the life, any 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 activity of living needs to be understood in its milieu. Um, now, uh, this that holds for plants. Um, it also holds for animals. Um, Kungilem thinks uh, that animals um, have, uh, we might say, more of a world uh, than than plants um, because they, um, in his in, in his analysis, right, they they get up and they move around. They go out in search of um, <clears throat> they go out in search of, of food, uh, et cetera. Uh, and human beings, uh, we are a, a, a curious sort of um, animal for Kongulam because we have, through our technological capabilities, we have the power to vary the meaning of or to vary the milieu on the spot, as it were, mm -hmm. right? Through our practices and our techniques, um, our instruments, we are capable of transforming, um, you know, one in the same place into very different things. So what is, um, you know, what is a, um, <clears throat> what's a good example? What is a, you know, what is a classroom can all of a sudden become a surgical theater, um, right? <laughs> in, 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 the, in, in, in a particular context um, for just one uh, sort of example. Uh, and so, <clears throat> this uh, attention to milieu, I mean, is, is really important to who we are as human beings. Um, and uh, Kongilem talks about humans as having a world um, that is a collection of various different kinds of milieu um, or meaningful spaces or places that we enter and exit as we, as we, as we live. 
so I don't know if I'm responding to your mm-hmm. question entirely, but yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, but but so I think he applies that right to his to the study of the history of science as as well. Um, he tries to locate, um, <clears throat> say these these thinkers who said there's no real difference between the normal state and the pathological state. He localizes them in the larger culture in which they lived, an industrial culture that right was bent on transforming the world through human uh industry and, and uh technique okay so the importance of the the vitalist aspect is a sort of an outside of that mechanistic framework of pure quantification yeah i think that's right i think that's right <laughs> okay okay um there's something you something really interesting to sort of bring in even more to <laughs> throw even more onto the pile of you know it's becoming clearer and clearer why it's it's all uh, many philosophers of course many of their ideas are all tied up together but with Kongiem this seems uh, they're very tightly woven um you you state um as nutrition excretion reproduction are in a just equilibrium in a healthy individual so would it be in a healthy society monarchy oligarchy democracy in in a in a just equilibrium and was there a, a clear connection for Kongiem? i mean it's quite a simple question i guess between this notion of biological equilibrium which goes all the way back to galen with the idea of the silencing of the organs that your organs should be should be balanced and if they're in silence then you're you're healthy and the idea of a, a sort of i guess a, a silence of the political organs of of if if society is you know, uh, basically, is there a for Kongiem? Was there a similarity between the political modes of equilibrium and biological modes of equilibrium? Yes, glad we answered that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, so I, I think, uh, but, but it's but it's um, but it's complicated, <laughs> of course. Yeah. Uh, and damn, so there is there is a similarity, and you know the way you were phrasing your question there uh, called to mind. Uh, you know, something that uh, that the Kongi Lam. So this is a point, this this quotation uh, is a point that comes up uh, via Alain um, mm-hmm. and uh, and Alain's ideas about what a what a just society would look like. It's uh, or what a, what a decent society would look like anyway. It would be a democracy in which, uh, you know, people are able to live their lives. So in that sense, there would be a kind of silence of the larger organisms of, um, you know, uh, of, of the larger organs, I should say, uh, of, of society. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, uh, I think at one point, uh, Alain complains um, about people who say, but, you know, but life in a democracy is boring and, you know, it's all mediocre. It's banal. Uh, and he says something like, yeah, but this is the way it should be. Mm-hmm. Uh, or, you know, this, this is, this is the, the best kind of life. Uh, this allows for the best kind of life for, uh, for people. Um, so I think, uh, going back to the sort of the, going back to the question of the complication between the parallel between, um, vital processes, uh, and social political processes, mm-hmm. uh, in, so for Kangi Lam, in a way, society, we could say this, society um, is a kind of expression of an organic need for coherence. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, so societies organize themselves, gives, give themselves organs in the same way that a living individual, biological individual, is, a, is an organized system. But the the sort of coherence that can be achieved in society Kongilem thinks will is in no way matches the kind of tight relation that exists between the organs within the larger whole that they serve in a in a in a living thing okay and this is this seems clearly then where this importance of error comes in because if in that framework of equilibrium if you develop a norm, maybe might even be able to say an artificial norm, and strive to somehow meet that norm, which is never, of course, possible, then, of course, everything which is adverse to the norm is an error or is incorrect or is wrong and therefore has to be sculpted and brought back 
which isn't that isn't equilibrium that's like a forced you know authoritarian way of developing some sort of uh controlled normality uh whereas this emphasis of sort of turning error back on itself of saying no error isn't important because it shows you what's wrong it's important because it shows you what you believe to be wrong you know and it shows what we've built as to be the foundation so error seems to be then the the catalyst for a just and you know a, a just equilibrium it's the thing we should constantly experiment with to be able to develop an actual equilibrium yeah, I, I think that's I think that's right. Um, with the caveat uh, that uh, for Congulam, I don't think we can ever achieve this equilibrium. Uh, so health and justice um, to follow those two separate paths. Health and justice are um, are something like ideals mm -hmm. um, against which we uh, sort of measure <laughs> the the difficulties that we currently face. Um, and, but I, th I think uh, you're exactly right to say that attention to error for Congulam is essential. Um, and we need to, I think what he's, what he would add to what you were saying is that we need to beware of uh, applying the scientific interpretation of error as mistaken belief to mm -hmm. other forms of activity or life in the world in which we live. Because when we go beyond those, the, when we take, uh, uh, scientific practice beyond its limits in those ways, um, we, we, well, we set ourselves up for, for disaster. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, right, uh, rather than uh, error in the scientific sense, Kangilam would say we should be um, thinking about, like you were saying, experimentation, trial and error, and we should be encouraging the diverse forms of life, including sickness. Um, we should be finding ways of responding to them that are creative um, and supportive rather than um, treating them as errors to be eliminated. Mm -hmm. And this is this seems to be, I mean, there's been many times throughout our conversation here where I've thought, okay, that's Foucault, that's Foucault. But this is uh, obviously the, the most sort of obvious influence here from Foucault is that um, Foucault's, I guess, concern of the potential abuses of power in relation to the creation of a medical or biological norm. And in a sense that people can be controlled um, via that form of power in the sense that you feel, uh, I guess, in a certain way, uh, compelled to conform to some sort of sociological norm, which is backed by uh, some biological points such as, I don't know, depression or anxiety or the idea that depression isn't a, a legitimate emotion. It's an it's a fault from what you know so it's like no you're not allowed to be unhappy things are meant you're meant to be normal and happy you're wrong and everything else is completely fine <laughs> you know you should love your nine to five office job so you have to take these tablets whereas of course the uh the more healthy discussion is to say well let's look at the milieu and develop from that whether or not this entire thing we believe should be making people happy is you know which one is actually correct there. So, I mean, I think I'll just ask the bigger question there, though, that, that, that there's so much influence with Foucault. I mean, do you think there's some clear areas where there's actually perhaps even disagreement between the two thinkers? Or is Foucault sort of always emphasising or digressing from Congiam? Yeah, so I think that's a, uh, <clears throat> a great question. Uh, you know, I, I'm tempted to use language like critical appropriation, critical extension, critical transformation when I think mm -hmm. about uh, these different authors in relation to each other. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I think Foucault shares sort of the spirit of uh, Congulam's philosophy in some ways uh, of resistance. Uh, and so as profoundly sort of um, indebted uh, Foucault's own work is to Congulam, um, he's... Right. And he also shares the method. So he wants to sort of try to turn Congulam against himself and see, you know, well, what 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 comes of this? Um, <clears throat> so uh, if we if we read Congulam uh, against himself. Um, and so one of the interesting places where this happens is with um, mental illness, um, where so so Congulam argues that in somatic illness, right, 
you know, when my organs <laughs> make themselves heard, I, I, you know, I feel pain. And so I go and I seek help mm -hmm. um, unless I can somehow tough it out or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> but I go and I, I, I seek help. Um, <clears throat> whereas in the case of mental illness, severe mental illness, um, <clears throat> Kongulam says, you know, I, the, it's the, the person doesn't know that they have a problem. Mm -hmm. And so we need the psychiatrist to intervene on their behalf to, to help them. So this is right. This is the, in, in many ways, this is the topic of the history of madness. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, Foucault, and, and Foucault's argument that, well, that, you know, <laughs> right. In, intervening on behalf of someone is often a way of, um, you know, forcing them um, to accept a way of life that they don't want to, mm -hmm. um, or, you know, using, uh, science as an instrument of power uh, <clears throat> to uh, encourage them to accept a way of life uh, that is deeply dissatisfying. Mm. Uh, so I think there's, um, so I think right there, there are some uh, major uh, critiques that Foucault levels against Kangulem. Kangulem's response, however, is interesting. Uh, he says, you know, when I read Foucault's History of Madness, um, I realized that I had discovered a great philosopher. Uh, and so there is a there's a kind of openness right to critique um, there an appreciation of it on Kondi Lem's part. So I'm I you know like I sort of trying to think about conceptually uh, Foucault in relation to Kondi Lem. Um, you know I I would say Kondi Lem really emphasizes biological normativity, mm -hmm. um, and is also right is also very aware of the way social context influences norms biological norms. Um, so he's fully aware of social normativity. Um, but, but I think Foucault's big move is to say, no, we need to pay more attention to the, the social shaping of norms and how those impact um, our experience um, as individuals, biological and, and otherwise. Do you think maybe the, the difference there seems seems to be uh, Nietzsche in the sense that Foucault has this big influence, of course, from Nietzsche in the sense that it seems Kongiem is more focused on the equilibrium, the, that that idea we spoke about of um, this is how things should be, you know, oh, democracy is so boring. And it reminds me of that old Greek saying of, oh, I hope you live in times of change, which people thought, well, that's nice. But it's like, no, they, they meant that as uh, they meant that as an insult. Um, so the it seems maybe that in experimentation for Kongiem is to not live in times of change, to be able to maintain that equilibrium and to develop an understanding of health and justice, which is to maintain the equilibrium. Whereas, and this is why I mentioned Nietzsche, which is the devaluation of all values that maybe for Foucault, and especially obviously his personal biography as well, in that experimentation, there's actually more potential to really break free of things as opposed to draw them in and have some equilibrium you know it would just wouldn't surprise me if Foucault wanted more change in a sense of what 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 values can we sort of break here with this method of thinking yeah so I think th uh, the way you put that is really uh, interesting and I'm I am tempted to both agree and disagree <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and so I mean I think Alain is really um, <clears throat> For Alain, this question of equilibrium is really important. Uh, and Kongulem himself lived through um, <clears throat> of, uh, you know, turbulent times, mm -hmm. uh, lived through interesting times, times of transformation and, and deep change. Um, <clears throat> and so he was aware of, and I think he thought it was important to be able to, um, to face um, such changes. And I think, right, that, like, whether they're on the, like, broad social level, uh, <clears throat> the political level, mm -hmm. um, or in terms of one's own life, in terms of getting sick, mm -hmm. uh, how do we, how do we respond to that? Um, and so I think transformation is really important. Uh, alteration, the word that he uses a lot, becoming other is really important for, for Kangulem. Um, and we need to be aware of the inevitability of, of becoming other. Um, and be able to to respond um, to this. That said, 
Um, and, and so he even at some point says, you know, I'm like a, I'm a Nietzschean without, you know, without the proper paperwork. Um, <laughs> um, but, uh, but that said, I think you're, you're right to say that, um, you know, in some respects, Foucault is more interested in the possibility of, you know, what might come through some profound alterations of society, whereas Kangulem recognizes the possibility, the inevitability of alteration, but tries to fashion a way of living um, that is uh, that has endurance, that can carry on in the face of um, profound trauma. Okay, yeah, that's clear. <laughs> so why why is it for um, Kangulem? Does he ever really? Right about, I'm sure he does. Does he ever really comment on why it is science n- no longer wants to experiment and and seeks out these 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 norms? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, there are maybe a number of different ways to get into this, but I, I think I would say, uh, sort of in short, the uh, <clears throat> right the scientific project, the search for truth and for understanding emerges for Kangilam in experiences of difficulty Mm -hmm. Uh, and the interpretation of things not turning out the way we wanted the interpretation of failure or difficulty as the result of some error uh, that's what gets the possibility of a search for truth off the ground if i uh, you know try to make something happen and it doesn't work out i might be inclined to say, oh, well, if I had only like had an, a better idea, mm-hmm. uh, <clears throat> then I would have been able to do this thing successfully. So technique really nourishes and the, the failures of technique or the difficulties of technique really nourishes the scientific project. Um, <clears throat> and it also gives shape to, it gives shape, it characterizes truth, right? If I know the truth. What is that? I have security. I have something I can hold on to that I can use in other situations. And so I think in in Kangilam's mind, um, truth brings with it this character of um, stability, if not uh, sort of like eternal unchangingness. Like that's Mm -hmm. the hope. Uh, That's the invention. Um, And so there's going to always be this danger um, in uh, the production of knowledge that we grasp you know we 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 gain some understanding or we think we gain some understanding and then we say ah this is it we can hold on to this forever and deploy it in all sorts of different situations um and i think that's the that's kind of where the the straight jacket uh uh possibility uh the emerges this Mm -hmm. forgetting of the importance of of experimentation so it's a it's a, a curious understanding of truth uh that Kangilem has it is a kind of creation of living okay okay um why do you why do you think it is he's um overlooked i mean we've we've cited probably about 10 different philosophers who he's who he's directly influenced and they all they all you know it's not a, a hidden thing either it's not someone they've shied away from they've all making it fairly explicit that this is where their big influences come and um, you know we spoke before we started recording about the the fact that there's sort of this Kongiem rebirth at the moment, so perhaps it's wrong to say he's been ignored, but he seems to have been underappreciated up until now. Do you think do you think there's any reasons for this, or do you think it's just once again one of those cases of just didn't happen to be in the right place at the right time? <laughs> yeah, I mean I think in his in his own day, you know, in so in the, the French academic context. Mm-hmm. Um, he was really important in the mid 20th century. Like he, um, he was selected to, uh, uh, lead a UNESCO inquiry into the, uh, teaching of philosophy around the world among member nations. Uh, and he was, he was selected to write the lead essay that tried to synthesize and bring everything together. Wow. So he was, um, I think, uh, right, uh, a very important uh, philosopher in mid 20th century. Um, and like you were just saying, he's like his influence or importance for many philosophers in the younger, in the, the 1968 generation, for instance, um, is, is really profound. Um, so 
Uh, that said, uh, I think uh, maybe some of his students were more interested in being well known and participating in well publicized debates than he was. Mm -hmm. um, that's a possibility. Um, but I think it's also important to remember, you know, those who knew him recall his uh, reserve, mm -hmm. as they call it, um, sort of a philosophical and personal sort of reticence uh, to uh, <clears throat> to to put himself at the center of uh, of conversations um, that were going on, um, but also reserve in the in the sense of you know having reservations, not mm -hmm. being willing to assent uh, to to what other people are are, are saying. Um, but I think uh, you know this certainly has had uh, an impact on um, on his work. I mean, if you read his uh, the normal and the pathological or his other um, the works that he published during his lifetime, most of them are on topics that are pretty obscure. You know, the history of the reflex concept. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, you know, that this is not something that most people are, are, are reading about. Um, so he willingly, I think, um, positioned himself to sort of engage in, a, in a investigations into science that he thought were essential for understanding our, our broader society modern societies um, but he also did so in a way where he was kind of uh withdrawn uh, <clears throat> from a lot of public uh discussion that said uh there's this great essay that needs to be translated it's short he wrote it for a uh a french lycée in portugal it's called experience and adventure it's about three pages long uh and in it he argues that there is both a need for experience and a need for silence about our experience. Um, so I, I think we can get some ideas about the, the sources of his reserve uh, there. Um, but <clears throat> he thought that, um, and maybe there's another possible connection with Sayre here, um, that, that the, we silence about our own experience is essential for being able to continue on in our lives um, when we sh when we try to share our experience, it is it's actually not communicable. Mm -hmm. um, so he ends up. I mean, maybe this is why I often think of the boat at sea when I think of of Kungi Lem. Um, you know, his image uh, that he he deploys in this essay is of uh, the Portuguese explorers mm -hmm. um, and and their experience going out uh, to sea. And the, the, the difficulty they faced in trying to actually convey what happened, um, you know, the Portuguese national epic, the Lusiads, uh, is talks about the gods and monsters they encountered on this um, voyage. So there's something about, uh, in Congulem's words, authentic experience that is not communicable. Um, and I think that's that is why he is, uh, has, to some extent, you know, put himself in a position where he um his works wouldn't be center stage okay okay that makes sense um obviously there is tons more we could speak about but is there anything key um you feel we've missed that you'd like to to add in no i mean i i would add uh only this you know my book is really about the the first half of his uh career the 1960s, these were the 60s that saw uh, molecular, uh, th these were the, the decade that saw uh, molecular biology really take off in France uh, in the, the early 70s as well. Um, and so there were profound transformations in the life sciences that I think, uh, you know, Kangi Lam responded to over the, the, the rest of his, his life. Um, so there's more, more work that needs to be done on thinking about error here. Um, and the reason I bring it up is that, you know, we can read molecular biology in the 60s and 70s as confirming Kangi Lam mm -hmm. because uh, they, uh, people like uh, Francois Jacob um, and others show that or argued that we have to understand life in terms of error that it is, um, you know, errors in the, uh, <clears throat> the, the replication of genetic material that leads to mutations. Uh, and 
Uh, <clears throat> so this, in a way, is a confirmation of Congulam's ideas about the central importance of error in our lives. But on the other hand, he experiences it as a profound threat because it is saying that we now have a scientific objective understanding of these errors. They're no longer uh, potentially a, uh, a human uh, problem that we have to grapple with in our lives. And so he worries about you know, the dangers of a, of a genetic medicine and what that might bring. Uh, uh, and his response, at least initially, is to say, you know, ask anyone on the street what they think about uh, the possibility of genetic error, and their response will not be one uh, of saying, oh, yeah, uh, right, that's something that the sciences know about. Uh, the response will be, that is profoundly terrifying mm -hmm. to be born in a way that one is sick uh, to begin with. This is profoundly terrifying. Uh, and so he really holds on to this, the, the meaning that um, error and the fear of error has in our lives. Okay, okay. Um, whereabouts can we find your, your book? Uh, you can find it uh, through Paul Grave Macmillan. Uh, I have... Uh, uh, copy here uh or i think i have well <laughs> i i yeah uh, you can find it via paul grave mcmillan um you can find it anywhere fine books are sold <laughs> is what i would say okay um yeah are you are you working on anything congian based at the moment working on a new book or Yes. So the, uh, the eventual plan is, uh, to work on a second volume, uh, thinking about error in, uh, in the later, the later Kangi Lam. Um, I'm also, uh, fascinated by, I think, you know, as I was mentioning, uh, Francois Delaporte earlier. Uh, so I've been thinking about, uh, his, uh, his book on disease and civilization, writing a paper, uh, about that. Uh, and, I've also been doing some more work on uh, Kungulam and, and his relation to, to Bachelard, uh, which is a, I think, complicated sort of affair. But in brief, I would say this, uh, and basically what I've, what I've said a, a, a little while ago already, you know, Kungulam borrows much uh, from the philosophers he reads, but he's also very resistant <laughs> and uh, and um, so as much as he borrows from Bachelard, I think he's also engaged in a kind of uh, critique of his idea, um, his idea in, in particular, or the reality that Bachelard experienced that he couldn't write about um, poetic experience and scientific experience. He couldn't bring these together. I think uh, Kangi Lam's own writings about the history of life sciences is exactly an attempt to bring together um, our experiences of creation and our ability, our experiences and abilities uh, to know uh, the world around us. Okay. I would ask you the, the horrible question, when do you think the, the second volume be ready? But I'm sure it's a long way off. Yes, it is. It, it is a ways, ways off. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, it seems like a, a good place to finish up. So, um, Sam Talcott, thanks very much. All right. Thank you, James. It's been a pleasure to be with you here on your show.